You probably fall into one of two categories when it comes to this book of the Bible. A, you don't understand it. Or B, you do understand it and just don't like it. It's the angst-filled or angst-inducing book of Job. Hey guys, welcome to Scripture in 6 Minutes. If you're committed to reading God's Word, we're committed to helping you understand it. Now in this episode, we're tackling one of the most well-known but most unsettling parts of the Bible, the book of Job. Now this story is actually one of the oldest in God's Word. Those of you who read the chronological Bible reading plan have probably noted that this story actually interrupts your reading of the book of Genesis because well, Job goes back a ways, okay? But what's his ancient story all about? Well, here's the simplest way to break down the book of Job. In chapters 1 and 2, we meet Job, a righteous, upright, and wealthy man who's been greatly blessed by God. However, because Satan thinks that Job only loves God because God has blessed him, the devil asks God for permission to attack Job and gets it. Then Satan steps in, sweeps away Job's livestock, his children's lives, and even Job's health. And when his friends hear about Job's misfortunes, they come and sit with him to comfort him because his suffering is great. Well, in chapter 3, Job wells this bitter, soul-wrenching lament about his grievous state, which causes his friends to share their theological perspective on Job's situation across the next 28 chapters. Now these three dudes, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they might have had good intentions, but their bedside manner is as bad as their theology, okay? Seriously, these are the guys who show up at the hospital after you've been diagnosed with lung cancer and tell you God's paying you back for that one puff of one cigarette you smoked all the way back in junior high 56 years ago. Well, then a new character enters the plot in chapter 32, a young man named Elihu. Now, when it's finally his turn to speak, he torches Job's friend's theology. He confronts Job about his self-righteousness and magnifies God as the sovereign Lord of the universe whose will is both perfect and just. And then, speaking of the Lord, he shows up in chapters 38 to 42 and thunders in and speaks for himself. The questions he hurls at Job are as terrifying as they are poetic. Who darkens counsel without knowledge? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Was it you who established the borders of the ocean? Can you put a leash on Leviathan? Do you have an arm like mine? Do you speak with a voice like mine? Well, Job doesn't necessarily get the sense that God's angry with him, but Job doesn't get any answers from God either. The questions that God uh, raises to Job just point Job back to God's undeniable majesty, not an explanation, which is the tough part of Job's story and ours, because we really like answers. Well, the final lines of this book show Job repenting of his sins, his friends offering a sacrifice to God because of their bad theology, and God blessing Job by giving him a double portion of everything he lost, including seven more sons and three more daughters. Now, it's about as happy an ending as you can hope for, but as you can see, the book of Job raises some really messy questions. Like, why do bad things happen to godly people? And where is God when life hurts? And what's the righteous response to suffering? And why in the world does Satan get to walk around heaven in the first place? Well, Job doesn't get an answer to any of those questions, but what he does get is a realization that can be helpful to us when we go through similarly hard times. He says, God is unchangeable, and who can turn him back? What he desires, that he does. For he will complete what he appoints for me, and many such things are in his mind. Translation, God's going to do what God wants to do, guys. And even if it's uncomfortable or painful, we should trust him because he loves us perfectly. Now, by the way, in case you've never noticed it, the whole arc of Job's story points us to hope in Jesus' ultimate triumph. 
You see, like his father, Jesus might not always provide us with explanations, but like his father, Jesus always provides us with victory. And a day is coming when he's going to wipe away every single tear from every single eye. And that is glorious news. Look, guys, there's far too many lessons in this marvelous book to mention them all, let alone explain them. But here are just a few of the big ones to get you going. You can't miss these, okay? Number one, spiritual warfare and suffering are inevitable realities, so learn to deal with them the right way by drawing close to God in those seasons, okay? Number two, bad theology is everywhere, so be very careful who you listen to. Study God's Word so you don't fall victim to it. Number three, Satan has no power outside of God's permission. 100% of the times that Satan attacked Job in the story, he had to get God's permission to do so. And furthermore, the devil had to operate within the parameters that God set. Satan might be beyond your control, guys, but he's not beyond God's control. So number four, you may not get every answer you want in life. And on top of that, you might not like every answer you get in life, but trust God anyway. Why? Because number five, God gets the last word. He always has, and he always will. And it's a good word. Look guys, I'm not telling you that the book of Job is an easy message, okay? But it's the perfect message when life isn't easy. So take the time to wade through the book of Job now, so you'll be prepared for future struggles. And then join us right back here for our very next episode of Scripture in Six Minutes.